Welcome colleagues, friends and guests. It's my honor to welcome you to the University of Cape Town for the latest talk in our Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture Series. The VC's Open Lecture Series was started so that anyone in the community, whether inside the university or not, would have the benefit of hearing firsthand from academics, researchers, and innovators, both from South Africa, but especially from around the world. And we have had a, a series now, many, each year of distinguished speakers uh, speaking on this platform to, to the community and to the public. And it's in this context that we have invited world-renowned criminologist, Professor John Braithwaite, and we thank him for accepting our invitation to speak today. Professor Braithwaite's topic, Restorative Justice, Republican Vision and Justice as a Better Future, is, is apt considering not only our country's debate around the transformation of the South African justice system, but also because it fits in with one of the five major themes of social challenges which we're attempting to address as an institution. The Child Justice Act, which came into effect in April 2010, marks South Africa's probably most recent and perhaps most significant legal foray into restorative justice provides for several diversion options, including family group conferencing, victor offender mediation, or as it says in the act, quote, any other restorative justice process which is in accordance with the definition of restorative justice. Efforts to both humanize the juvenile justice system and protect the rights of children in conflict with the law <coughs> present their own unique sets of challenges, particularly for us in the Western Cape, where gang warfare continues to plague our townships and communities. At the university more generally, as I said, we, have, we are seeking to make a significant impact uh, and contribution to this problem and to other issues through our safety and violence initiative, which pulls together several academics across the institution who work in and on issues related to crime and violence. The Centre for Criminology is one of the core members of SAVI, the Safety and Violence Initiative, and has been instrumental in hosting Professor Braithwaite today. The Centre is a research unit in the Faculty of Law, which explores shifts within governance of security, with a particular focus on changes in the sources of insecurity and developments in responses to them. At present, its work is organised around two principal foci, namely developments in policing, particularly within Africa, and secondly, the emergence of new environmental risks and responses to them. To say just something brief about Professor Braithwaite, his uh, introduction is also in the adverts and invitations that you will have received, so I won't repeat that. Um, he's particularly interested in the role of restorative justice, responsive regulation, shame management, and reintegration in crime prevention. His book, Crime, Shame, and Reintegration, in, published in 1989, demonstrated that current criminal justice practice tends to stigmatize offenders uh, in a way that makes the crime problem worse. He argues that restorative justice enables both offenders and citizens by way of mediation to repair the social harm caused by crime. His powerful and striking theories and vision have positioned him as a world-leading social scientist. Furthermore, by aiming at social justice, participative democracy, sustainable development, and world peace, he has characteristically put his scientific engagement at the service of an ethical vision of humanity and society. In 2001, he established Regulatory Institutions Network, or RegNet, a worldwide network of institutions, practitioners, and academics, researching the key domain of regulation with an eye towards human rights, justice, and sustainable environmental policy. He has also embarked on a 20-year comparative project called Peacebuilding Compared, an ambitious study which seeks to compare peacebuilding efforts in 48 conflicts throughout the world. And in fact, his visit to South Africa over this two-week period is part of collecting data on South Africa's experience in peacebuilding after conflict over a 20-year period. Professor Braithwaite is the recipient of a number of international awards and prizes for his work including an honorary doctorate at the University of Leuven in Belgium, Europe's leading university in the field of restorative justice, 
the Stockholm Prize in Criminology in 2006, the Prix Emile Durkheim of the International Society of Cr Criminology for Lifetime Contributions to Criminology in 2005. So I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in welcoming Professor J John Braithwaite to the podium. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in beautiful Cape Town. I love South Africa and love South Africans and uh, the hospitality uh, from the University of uh, Cape Town has, uh, has been uh, uh, so warm and kind. Restorative justice is about restoring victims, restoring offenders, restoring communities. It's about the idea that because crime hurts, justice should heal. Uh, in my part of the world, and in South Africa as well, uh, an increasingly dominant form of restorative justice involves putting together a restorative justice conference. And, and that's, that's done in a, a way rather like this, although there are many variations depending on what level of the criminal justice system uh, a restorative justice conference is, is set up. So, so in a common way of doing it, a restorative justice facilitator would speak with the, with, the, with the alleged offender and ask the offender who they would like to be there to support them uh, during the ordeal of the restorative justice conference. And likewise, the victim will be met with before the event and be explained that the, uh, the offender has been encouraged to bring along the people that are most important to the offender in their life and it won't be good if the victim is there without also having a support uh, 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 network. Those two communities of care then come together, discuss who has been, who has been harmed, uh, who has needs that need to be met as a result of, of this crime occurring, and then together they will draw up a plan of, uh, of action which will usually be signed uh, by, as an agreement uh, by the uh, alleged perpetrator signed by the victim and things will be agreed to be done. Often there will be follow-up conferences uh, to ensure that what is agreed is actually done and sometimes there will be a celebration conference to celebrate the fact that reintegration embraced back into the community uh, has occurred. So it's a different philosophy of who's assembled in the room. In a criminal trial, those in the room are in a sense those who can inflict maximum damage on the other side. In a restorative justice conference, those in the room are those who can offer most support to their own side, be it the victim's side or the, or, or the offender's side. And, and that's, an important, that's been an important move, the research has suggested, away from dyadic one-on-one -on -one victim offender mediation. For one thing, it, it muddies the imbalances of power in the room so that uh, in the offender's support network and the victim support network, they, there will be both adults and children, men and women, more and less educated people uh, and, and, and so on. There will still be imbalances of power, but they will be rendered more complex depending on how good a job the facilitator has done at encouraging a diverse uh, support network around uh, the key players uh, in, the, in the conference. Now let me, let me tell you a story of what seemed like a pretty disastrous conference, one of the first conferences that I attended. Uh, in rural New South Wales, arrived at the conference with, with the facilitator and, 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 and this, this was a conference relating to a 14-year-old girl who with a number of 14-year-old girls was, uh, was a pretty big time burglar in this town. They were really totally cleaning out houses which was not, not something that we think of 14-year-old uh, of girls as doing but they, uh, they really were. When we arrived at the conference, the girl's mother was arriving and protested that she didn't think it was a very good idea that this be dealt with in this way. The facilitator said, let's 
let's just try to see how this works and if we all make an effort, we, it, it, we, we may make some progress here today. And uh, she looked uh, terribly unconvinced and indeed, when we walked into the room, her 14-year-old daughter was there waiting for us to arrive and mum said to her, her daughter, I'll kill you, you little bitch. Um, excuse my language. Uh, to which mum replied with something slightly more appropriate, like, hi, mum, and uh, we sat down. Well, we were barely into the, the conference, just a couple of minutes, and mum was up and pointing finger at her, her daughter, saying, this is a load of nonsense. She should be punished, and stormed out of the conference, and after which there was a long silence. So I looked away across to the facilitator and said that uh, our, our innovation, our, story, our criminal justice innovation is really working well, uh, isn't it? But actually, it turned out to be a pretty good conference in the end, because all of these victims came along to the conference extremely angry, wanting to uh, uh, really hit hard against this girl and uh, in this new context revealed about the nature of the relationship between she and her mother and her father uh, didn't come uh, a, a, at all, there was a new kind of empathy uh, for the condition of living uh, that this 14-year-old uh, uh, found herself in and it was revealed that she was refusing to live at home with her parents, it became clearer, although de this was not gone into in detail, that she was a suffering abuse at the hands of both of her parents. This turned out to be a shock uh, to aunts and uncles, uh, and indeed uh, sisters to a degree, uh, who were assembled for the event, and a homeless child was found a new home to live in. Uh, uh, there were offers from her uncle and her sister to come and live with them. She wasn't going to school, an important part of the agreement. The victims became less concerned of compensation for their loss of property uh, from the burglary and happy for the insurance company to take care of that. In any case, the child didn't have much to offer them by way of compensation. There were some gestures of compensation, but the important part of it, the agreement and the part that gave the victims uh, the greatest sense of satisfaction and closure was actually persuading the girl to return to school and to stop, uh, and to stop living uh, on the street uh, with her burglary gang. Restorative justice is also about a shift from the model of responsibility in our criminal law, which is the passive responsibility model, to an active responsibility model. Our criminal law is based on the idea that we hold people responsible for things that they've done in the past. Restorative justice, in contrast, is about the idea of inviting people to take responsibility for putting things right into the future. It's about active responsibility as a virtue feel like there's a kind of a virtue ethics uh, coming in uh, uh, at, this, uh, at this point. But it's, it's a future-oriented uh, conception of responsibility where not all of the responsibility rests uh, with the perpetrator. Responsibility is also actively taken in that story that I told uh, by the aunts and uncles and sisters who offered to take the 14-year-old girl uh, into their home. They felt that they, there was something that they could do to repair the harm, seeing it as a sort of a family responsibility and not just uh, going into the future and not just a backward-looking responsibility that should be fully Im imposed on this child uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the burglary. And a whole set of new and unexpected problems that had to be investigated in other ways. Clifford Shearing uh, from the University of uh, Cape Town, uh, in his work, which has been a 
incredible inspiration to people working on restorative justice and trying to think about a, a more holistic, open textured way of thinking about justice. Uh, the, the Zuela Temba project that he and others uh, led uh, here uh, in, uh, 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 in Western Cape. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the many useful conclusions it came to is that what people were seeking uh, in the 1990s, which was the, the period in which this project was uh, at its height, was justice as a better future that when you talk to people about what's the most important aspect of justice that they wanted, after the rich deliberation that was involved in the Zuela Temba project, and that's a key point, what they wanted more than anything was justice as a better future. The better victim empowerment works in restorative justice, the more that victims manifest that priority for justice as a better future. If you don't empower victims very much, they're more likely to opt for a punitive uh, form of uh, justice. And in a sense, uh, uh, Clifford Zuela Temba work was in a continuum with works that he, work that his former colleagues at the uh, University of Toronto, Clifford was uh, for a long time with director of the Centre for Criminology at the University of Toronto and part of their program of work was about showing that the more information uh, that uh, participants in a justice process had, the less punitive they become. So that in, in one simple experiment, for example, if you show uh, uh, a random sample of citizens a newspaper report on a, on a criminal trial and ask them what's an appropriate sentence for the offender to get, they will come up with, on average, a considerably more punitive sentence uh, than the court came up with. If, on the other hand, you give them an edited transcript of the same trial that the judge sat through, they will come up with more or less the same penalty that the judge came up with. If you give them the richer sort of engagement that as well a timber project or a restorative justice pro process of some other form uh, offers to the, where, the, where there's a lot of process control in the hands of all the participants in the justice process, they will be less punitive again. And they will be more interested in the shearing vision of justice as a better future. And justice uh, as a better future is in part a way of thinking in an inspiring way about the South African story of post-apartheid, of post-conflict justice. Active responsibility is, uh, is also about a Republican conception of citizenship, um, wanting to argue, as Clifford also, Clifford Shearing also argued in his work. Now, the Republican ideal is about freedom, uh, is about freedom as the most important political uh, value. But it's a different sort of conception of freedom from the liberal conception of freedom. Republican freedom is about the ideal of freedom as non-domination. So it's an earlier tradition of freedom that sort of predates uh, the rise of liberalism and is very much grounded in uh, that long era of human history when slavery was a dominant uh, institution, starting with the way the Greeks and the Romans thought about slaves. So that the Republican ideal of freedom is quintessentially the freedom of not being a slave, the freedom of not being dominated uh, by others. It's not that liberal conception of the freedom to buy more stuff, of the freedom to have more consumer choices. Uh, Afrikaans' political traditions, uh, uh, at least on my uh, uh, limited reading, is of a more uh, republican rather than liberal kind, a more social democratic uh, than uh, liberal tradition 
in a sense that uh, the uh, Afrikaans uh, uh, political traditions that are deeply embedded in this society were more influenced uh, by the 17th century Dutch Republic than Holland itself uh, is today. Ubuntu is a communitarian ideal that also fits the ideals of uh, republican freedom and republican empowerment that is a foundation for freedom based on engagement of each with every other. We are not born democratic. We have to be learn, we have to learn to be democratic and schools are very important places where we learn to be uh, democratic. So your reforms uh, here uh, with respect to justice for children are the important place to start and restorative justice in schools for dealing with daily problems uh, such as bullying in school is, is very Im important. Increasingly, those of us who engage with the social movement uh, for restorative justice have come to the view that we perhaps made a mistake in thinking that the criminal justice system to try to reduce the rate of imprisonment by replacing uh, some of the punitive justice in our society with more restorative forms of justice was perhaps a premature leap and the more important uh, emphasis uh, is to work at restorative justice in schools so that we have a new generation who experience through their, their personal experience of learning to be democratic citizens in schools uh, see, taste, experiment uh, through their own power to engage with their colleagues at, uh, at, at school uh, with restorative options as alternative to punitive justice in the education process. But at the end of the day, I guess restorative justice is about this Republican uh, vision that starting from seeing Western societies as jaded, uh, losing the momentum and interest in electoral po politics, uh, citizens feeling more and more remote from their elected representatives, both the executive branch of governance and the legislative branches of, of governance seeming, seeming a very long way away from something that ordinary citizens might want to engage with or have an opportunity uh, to engage with. But when we are a victim of crime, when one of our relatives or neighbours are, are a victim of crime, and when we are nominated to participate in community problem solving uh, through a restorative justice conference, it's a form of participation that it's hard to say no to. We feel honoured to be asked to support uh, the young person who lives next door to us, who has nominated us as an adult in their community who they would trust to be one of their supporters. So it becomes a lever for a kind of democratic engagement uh, that uh, is increasingly being lost in Western uh, democratic society. So the ideal uh, that the judicial branch can be the kind of the engine room for re-energising democracy and republican val values of engagement and non-domination much more than the uh, executive uh, and other branches of governance. The evidence increasingly is that uh, it can also, restorative justice can also help make uh, the judicial branch of governance uh, more effective in its job. Uh, in terms of crime uh, prevention, there are some uh, mixed results, but the important result uh, is that overall, in the meta-analyses of uh, you know, more than 40 evaluations with credible control groups of restorative justice innovations, uh, we've done a number of randomised control trials uh, in, uh, in my hometown in, uh, in Canberra. The effect size in reducing subsequent criminality is not huge overall, but it's statistically significant. 
but it's particularly strong with more serious crime and with violent crime. So it works, it works best with violence. So for mine, there's a real connection with our peace building work that therefore I think it follows that restorative justice has an important place with peace building as well as with, uh, with crime prevention. Uh, in, the, uh, in the experiments that uh, uh, Larry Sherman, Heather Strang uh, did with us in Canberra over a 10 year follow up, you have about a 40% lower uh, reoffending rate among uh, violent uh, uh, young adult and uh, juvenile uh, offenders in our jurisdiction. So this means that restorative justice does provide us with an option for a society in which there is less punishment and less crime, and therefore more freedom as non-domination. Because to put someone in prison is an act of domination. Uh, to be a victim of crime, especially to be a victim of violent crime, is to be a victim of domination. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a, rest a restorative justice watershed. It had many strengths uh, that have inspired us uh, in uh, some ways in similar ways and, other, and, and in different ways from the inspiration that we received from Clifford's uh, Zuela Timber project. Many strengths, also many imperfections, and I don't want to summarise them today. I want to focus on one criticism that I might advance of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It couldn't deal with all of the healing that needed to be done with so many victims in just three years. It couldn't deliver all of the support services that were needed for so many victims of so many uh, terrible uh, crimes uh, with so many to process, so many things to do uh, in three years. And I think that's been an unfortunate thing that so many countries have copied the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission saying we want closure, we want three years, and then we want to move on and get, over, uh, and, 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 uh, get on with building justice as a, as, a, as a better future. That seems to me not the productive way to think about justice as a better future. I actually think that a permanent Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a good idea. Why? Because the worse the atrocity that a victim has suffered, the longer they take to be ready to step forward and engage in a conversation to record their memory for the collective memory of the, of the nation, if they want to meet with their perpetrator to do so, if there are questions about where loved one's bones are to be found, that they are finally ready uh, to ask, they should be. That should be their right to be able to ask that uh, whenever they are, they are ready uh, to ask it. And so the ideal of a, of a permanent Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that even when all of the victims have died out, it's worth preserving the institution, uh, even if the institution at that stage is no more than a, a repository for a museum. I've learned a lot from the Bougainville Civil, civil War, which is a, was a separate civil, civil war separating a Bougainville from uh, Papua uh, New Guinea. They didn't have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I've argued that it probably would have been a good idea if they had had one. But what they did have instead was a long-term, decades-long commitment uh, to uh, reconciliation processes at the, at the local village level. One reason that that's important that we learnt from Bougainville and have now seen in, in other cases is this. There's always a big geopolitical story about what a war is about. That's the, that's the big story that we read uh, in the newspapers. But when one's on the ground doing little local restorative justice processes in the aftermath of the uh, of the conflict to deal with trauma that perhaps 10 years on still has not been addressed. What we find is that the conflict in this locality, in a particular locality 
in a village society has very little to do with the big geopolitical story of the, of the conflict. It's about this chief taking his community into the conflict on one side because it's an opportunity to settle a land dispute with that chief that's been go on, uh, down the road that's been going on for a very long time. Sometimes it's about settling the score on, on uh, a matter like sexual in infidelity uh, between leaders. Uh, sometimes uh, in Bougainville about sorcery uh, that's gone back for, uh, for a long time. Even cases that went back to World War II where on Bougainville there was ter you know, incredible fighting between Japanese and US forces and some chiefs took their people onto the Japanese side and others on the American side. And there were atrocities that were never reconciled and they're being reconciled today in the aftermath of uh, healing from their civil war of the 1980s and, and, uh, and, and, and 90s. In Timor-Leste, uh, all, all, they, they did have a truth and reconciliation which was a rather effective uh, one in, in many ways. Uh, like the South African case, there was great disappointment and for good reason uh, with the failure to prosecute as many of the most serious offenders as most people felt uh, should have been prosecuted. They ran to safety in Indonesia and were protected from prosecution from the most part. There, there were 87, 88 uh, uh, criminal uh, conviction, but most of those were minor offenders who uh, were, Timor, were Timorese. One of the interesting things about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was it was in some ways a bit like yours in that the president, uh, Shanana Guzman, when he received the report, was unhappy uh, uh, about various aspects uh, uh, of it wasn't quite what he expected in certain regards, just as the ANC found it not quite what it, what it expected in certain ways here. And he initially refused to, uh, uh, to publish it and then after that refused to uh, table it in the parliament. But one of the good things that happened as a result of all of this uh, argy-bargy about what would happen with the report that sort of an infrastructure of the Truth and Recon their Truth and Reconciliation Commission kept going on for quite a while and kept being an active player in the polity. And they had a problem which is very common in post-conflict situation where you had a networked transformation of power that was led by a civilian resistance on a very wide front and then uh, the leadership sort of shut the network down and power was centralised in a few leaders uh, of the insurgency who basically ran the country. The UN was sort of comfortable with having just a few men who they could, uh, uh, who they could do business uh, with and uh, the, the most of the women uh, in those civil, civil society networks was excluded for power. But the, but the Truth and Reconciliation, their commission play, played a, a role as a check and balance in that new dispensation, uh, uh, criticising failures to re-empower women, that the women who made such a great contribution uh, in the struggle for the liberation of Timor, Timor were now being sidelined. And that was not an example of justice as a as a better future and the government should be called to uh, account for that. And of course it's, it is that problem of revolutionary leaders, of insurgency leaders who sweep into power with great authority and who command great respect and certainly people like Shanana Guzman and Jose Ramos Horta and uh, the other leaders, uh, the small group of leaders of uh, of uh, 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 Fretland deserved a, 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 a lot of respect. They were inspiring leaders, great strategists of how to go about the business of uh, liberating their country from oppression. But that resource, of course, you know, in the hands of a deft practitioner of networked power, 
concentrated power of taking over the, uh, the state can be, in a sense, uh, more dangerous than in other, any other set of hands. So it needs special kinds of checks and balances would be the argument uh, that uh, I, I want to put forward. Your Truth and Reconciliation report discussed justice as a better future. It discussed options such as a wealth tax, uh, options that in that case were, were not followed uh, through. Uh, I had a conversation uh, yesterday with Charles Vincenzo about the idea of a permanent Truth and Reconciliation Commission, whether it would have been a good idea uh, for South Africa. He said, you know, another alternative, John, would have been to retain the peace accord architecture nationally and the local peace committees, and that would have been another way of uh, moving down that path and maintaining an infrastructure of both ongoing reconciliation, ongoing collection of new, uh, new uh, truths, uh, new resources to contribute to the collective memory of the nation, and also this checks and balances options that I want to put on the table as a different way of thinking about justice as a better future. Uh, one of the functions uh, when Truth and Reconciliation Commissions are established as interim commissions could be to propose how it could monitor the ongoing accomplishment of peace with justice. Justice as a peaceful society with reconciliation, justice in land distribution, access to health, justice in access to justice, eradication of crime and corruption, poverty eradication, etc. Uh, perhaps there could be 10 of these or some such number and every year the Truth and Reconciliation Commission could produce a report on one of them and whether uh, the, uh, the new, the successor state is succeeding or not on that dimension of delivery of justice as a better future, and every decade the Commission could produce a report on whether overall there has been continuous improvement uh, in uh, peace, reconciliation and justice, including social and economic justice in the society. So the idea of a permanent uh, truth commission is partly about the separation of powers as the most important feature of Republican political architectures. For post-conflict societies, TRCs could be constitutionally entrenched with a small but significant function in a richer separation of powers. At the moment when a conflict ends and a regime falls, it's, it's a sort of a Rawlsian moment where the political players are in more of an original position than they are at any other moment. That is to say, the incumbent power holders are going out the door. So they're willing to be fair, fairer than they would normally be when they're clinging to the reins of power. The successor uh, forces are jostling for positions. No one knows, uh, everyone knew here I guess, that Nelson Mandela was going to be the first president, but no one knew at the, you know, at the moment of transition before ballots had been held and so on, whether his successor would be Thabo Mbeki or President Zuma or Cyril Ramaphosa or, or, or any one of a number of other people might have been credibly thinking that they might have been uh, the successor president. So they don't know whether they're making ground rules which will be protecting them from their political opponents or whether they will be imposing on their political opponents. And that's what we mean by it's a more Rawlsian moment where uh, uh, uniquely societies are able uh, to have a constitutional moment where something better is put in place constitutionally. I certainly think South Africa is a, is a case uh, of that. And in many post-conflict dispensations, we see uh, mandated representation of women in parliaments and uh, all sorts of things that were quite impossible at, at other moments when, for example, men are clinging to 
uh, to power. Constitutionally independent anti-corruption commissions, a constitutionally truth and reconciliation commission or national peace council, that's a watchdog of the independence of the anti-corruption uh, commission. The early South African republics in places like Orange Free State were, you know, had these social democratic and republican uh, elements committed to eliminating white poverty. The 1994 Republic was social democratic and redistributive in its vision as well, committed to eliminating poverty among all races. South Africa is an inspiring light on the Republican Hill. South Africa's constitutional moment when it can do really radical institutional redesign may have passed for now. But one of the best ways the whole world can honour South Africa is to learn from the inst inspiration of your constitutional moment how other, uh, how other countries can use their future constitutional moments at the end of their civil wars to build even more radical separations of powers that check the state, check powerful corporations as nations struggle along their journey toward justice as a better future. That's the essence of the Republican vision of deeper freedom, a freedom from poverty and corruption that might prevent future wars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Braithwaite. Um, we've got some time for questions and answers, so uh, let me open it to the floor straight away. We've got a roving mic, so if you put up your hand and indicate someone right at the back, we'll start with you, sir. So if you just wait for the mic. Introduce and yourself yeah, for the My name's John Cartwright. Um, I've worked with Clifford Shearing for a number of years on one of the projects, at least, that John's mentioned. And I'd like to suggest that the um, one of the strengths of the Zuela Timber version of peacemaking was that there wasn't actually explicit talk about truth and reconciliation. Uh, it was extremely pragmatic. It was not that there wasn't an ideal assumed by people, but when it comes to the truth, that's around what happened exactly. And there would come a moment in one of the peace gatherings where people would think, okay, yeah, we, we know what happened now. Okay, let's get on with the next step. And then when it came to the reconciliation side, it was not so much that this is what you expected in an explicit kind of way, but it's the kind of result that the process tended to produce in a very pragmatic kind of way, step by step. And perhaps one of the disadvantages of the Truth and, Re Truth and Reconciliation Commission, by contrast, was the way in which those words set up huge expectations. And as you say yourself, they might have been better met if it had been a continuing process rather than one big show, as it were, which is as it, as it appeared. So I think that uh, pragmatism combined, obviously, with an underlying idealism seems to be a recipe that produces the goods, that the, that the problems are less likely to happen again. Yeah. Uh, I think that is an important uh, learning from uh, you, uh, your work with Clifford and others, John, that uh, pragmatically, truth, justice, reconciliation unfold in very different ways in different contexts. So, so I think another one of the mistakes of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission model was the assumption that you've always got to have truth first and then from truth will follow reconciliation. I think that's quite a good way to go. But sometimes when you have justice first, you know, justice processes don't always deliver a lot of a lot of truth, but perhaps a little bit of truth. But sometimes justice will lead to truth, will lead to reconciliation. Sometimes reconciliation will happen first. In our work in Indonesia, we concluded that there was some pretty meaningful reconciliation going on, but that it was non-truth and reconciliation. But sometimes, uh, Truth came later. That it's a it's a it's a gradual, long-term process. So we shouldn't have a definitive theory of what's the right order for thing, these things to come out. In Bougainville, it was 
uh, you know, it was also interesting that you would often get a kind of collective admission, but no individual admission, so that you would, you would, you would, you would have a Bougainville Revolutionary Army company come to a village and say, we as a group would like to take responsibility for burning down your village and to, uh, and, and to, to say, uh, express our regret for that, to offer to do some practical rebuilding uh, in the village to answer your questions if there are uh, places that you would like to look for look for the bones of your loved ones to assist you with that and so on. But no personal admissions and you have a lot of perpetrators there uh, who have committed acts of rape and murder in the context of the raid on the village who are not stepping forward and uh, admitting to those individual crimes. But in the Bougainville process, very often they are five years or ten years later that that truth is coming out of a process of confidence building where they see that through the collective admission they don't get killed as a result of making the admission and that's a pretty, pretty big confidence building uh, step. Uh, and indeed, if they see some forgiveness as well, particularly from the family whose daughter they raped, uh, then they, they, they very often did uh, come forward and uh, make admissions about uh, their rape uh, to uh, the family and uh, to the to, uh, survivors of uh, others who were killed. In, in, other, in other ways. So it, so it is complex, but I think for all of that to work, you need a long run justice as a better future. Does your, your, your system of restorative justice recognise the power of forgiveness on the victim? Is there a, is there a place where that is, is honoured and recognised? It's important to create space for forgiveness Forgiveness usually doesn't happen. It is, as John Cartwright was saying, what actually happens more often is some more pragmatic dispensation to go on living with each other, to pay some compensation, to give assurances that will make people feel safer, that this won't happen again. But when forgiveness does occur, you know, the evidence is that it's, it's good for people. And it's not just good uh, for the healing of the suffering of, of, of victims and helping them to move on to the rest of their lives in a more productive way. Eliza Ahmed and, and I did, uh, uh, did work on bullying, both school bullying and workplace bullying uh, in both Bangladesh and in Australia. And one of the, uh, you know, we were, we, were, we were interested in testing reintegrative shaming theories and, and we, we, you know, we found an effect there that children who come from families who's, where, you know, where bullying conduct, where, where violent conduct is, is confronted and disapproved of, but where that's done in a reintegrative, loving way, where they're not rejected by the family for, for what they have done, but where there's not just nattering at bullying, but confrontation of the bullying, stopping and talking to the child about why this is. They said, well, yeah. So there was, there was an effect, uh, more reintegrative forms of, of shaming, less stigmatising forms of shaming and less bullying uh, in those cases. But a much bigger effect uh, in bullying reduction was forgiveness in the family. So the experience of forgiving, being in a family where you have forgiven and been forgiven is predictive of not engaging in bullying and also not being a victim of, of, of bullying. So, uh, you know, there's, there's this, in the, in, the, in, the, in the Western tradition, there's a lot of cynicism and doubt about, about forgiveness. And I think that is about demanding forgiveness of people. But if we, you know, forgiveness is a gift, just as apology is a gift. It's not something we can demand. But if we create a space for it, and it does happen, 
the benefits of forgiveness seem to be huge to me. Hi there, my name is Ashen Pancham. I'm a mechatronics engineering student. So I have two questions. The first one, how much do we need punitive justice? And the second question, um, how would it be possible in a society, possibly a small one, possibly a closed up society, to prevent crime from ever happening? So the first question was, how much do we need punitive justice? And the second one was, how do we prevent crime in a society which could be possibly small or closed off? Well, I think we do need punitive justice. You know, my own view is 95% of the people who are in our prisons can be dealt with in other, more productive ways, but there are cases where that is the appropriate response. And if you have a justice system that empowers people, you know, you, you've that they've got to be empowered with the punishment option as, uh, as well. So I think that, that follows from, uh, from everything that I've said. But what I'm hoping for is a conversation where people become more cynical about how counterproductive punitive social control can be and more open to the productive possibilities of more restorative uh, forms of justice. And I think restorative forms of justice can help with crime prevention. There are many things we need to do about crime prevention. Many of them can be quite banal things about target hardening and making it harder for people to steal our cars and, and so on. But one of the things about, uh, uh, about crime prevention is that it's kind of hard to motivate people to do the things that they need to do uh, to protect themselves from crime and to to prevent, uh, to prevent crime. And one of the things that restorative justice, the, the biggest effect size in the meta-analyses of restorative justice is on actual implementation of the agreement. And it's a counterintuitive result so that if a court orders a, a person to participate in, a, in an anger management program or a, uh, uh, or a drug rehabilitation, like alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that, they're less likely to complete it than they are if they agree to do it in a restorative justice process. And the same can, uh, it can be true of the police in the conference, you know, convincing victims that, look, you've just been burgled. The best predictor of being a victim of burglary is having just been burgled. I really recommend you put in given where you live, I really recommend you, you're putting in an alarm system. Otherwise, this is very, very likely to happen to you again in six months. So the conference becomes a, a venue for all sorts of crime preventive uh, uh, possibilities to actually be more likely to happen. My name is Charlene Swartz. The question, um, a critique of restorative justice is that it always asks too much of the victim. And I'd like to hear your response to that. And I suppose related is that um, it's also when you have very little to lose, people tend to try other remedies. When you have a lot, and it, it's an issue around class, I suppose, class and restorative justice. Um, and perhaps that's something that in South Africa has always been a critique, that we ask too much of victims, and it's often people who are impoverished who end up with alternative remedies, because if you're wealthy, you can always go to legal remedies and punitive remedies and financial remedies. So I'd really like to hear your comment on that. Well, I, I think the latter is, is a dilemma with, with all kinds of alternatives that whatever we do in the justice systems, anything that we do to create more options, they will be more creatively used by those with more resources to, uh, to harness them uh, creatively. So I think that, that, that indeed just has to be uh, uh, has, has to be conceded. In terms of asking a lot of victims, I, I guess I do believe in seeking to persuade victims of the benefits of restorative justice. I mean, of course, victims should not be pressed into participating. It has to be uh, totally voluntary. But seeking to persuade victims to participate seems to me a good idea. Because uh, the, the evidence of benefits for victims is much stronger than the evidence of benefits in crime prevention and other benefits for other members of the community and, uh, and perpetrators. 
randomised controlled trials on post-traumatic uh, stress symptoms for victims, uh, much lower in cases randomly assigned to restorative justice than in cases that go to go to court, and the the you know really big reductions in people angrily victims angrily wanting you know we have a question that would you like to do to the perpetrator s something equivalent to what he or she did did to you and this result drops from 46 to 6 percent in our Canberra uh, randomized controlled trial a huge a huge uh, uh, reduction uh, uh, after the restorative justice uh, conference and a big difference between court and conference. Sorry, that's the after difference between court and conference, 46% after the court case, 6% uh, after the restorative justice. I, I was head of a school and had four different occasions where I used the TRC process to change climates. I involved teachers, parents, and both victims and, and perpetrators. And it, it was a very healing process and one which really gave a much greater understanding in the perpetrators of just how far-reaching their, their actions were and brought about a much improved climate thereafter. So thank you for the work that you're doing and, and I really recommend it. But often victims are worse off in restorative justice but they're twice as likely to be better off so that we, we've got to pay attention to the cases where they're worse off as well. Uh, my name is Evan Kinnis. I um, wonder if you can comment a bit on the costs. You spoke of benefits of restorative justice, and I, um, and I wonder if you can comment on variables affecting the outcome of the process, such as inequality, which in our case is quite huge and is growing. Uh, and then I mean, our, our criminal justice system, uh, you have elements of the Justice Department and uh, Correctional Services experimenting and working within, uh, with uh, restorative justice whereas our police agencies have uh, developed a more militarized approach and, and in effect um, uh, are in the production of, of, of uh, producing more criminals. That's their business today. So I'd like you to, to, to comment on that type of uh, approach and levels of inequality and how that affects uh, outcomes. I think it's pretty early days with the research on how inequality plays into it. Um, I mean, there are some positive things to say about gender inequality. For example, in Canberra, we have a pretty civilised uh, court system by most international standards, with a lot of you know, with a, a comparatively feminised legal profession. There's still a male-dominated legal profession, uh, but in the it, 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 in our court cases randomly assigned to court. I can't quite remember the numbers, but I think the airtime for males speaking in the courtroom is about three times as much as the female speaking time, whereas in a restorative justice conference, women actually speak a bit more than men. Mm. So that's, that's a pretty relevant uh, kind of uh, equality evaluation. But I do think it's early days on uh, evaluating it in that regard and it's a bit hard because of the diversity of different restorative justice strategies in play. Hi, my name is Bulilan. I would like to get your thoughts perhaps maybe in a gang war situation where normally the victims are innocent bystanders. Would you think restorative justice would work, would work as opposed to punitive measures? And secondly, maybe if you could give us your thoughts maybe with regards to maybe strategies of, of dealing uh, or minimizing uh, gang wars, what, what would you say are, are the best solutions to that? Mm -hmm. In our part of the world, there has been some work done on restorative justice with uh, gangs. Uh, uh, Sinclair Dinan uh, did some very interesting work in, in Papua New Guinea, uh, which has a huge gang problem and a very high uh, crime rate that, that's rather gang uh, driven in cities like uh, Port Moresby, but other cities as, as well. So they have had uh, these experiments with gang surrenders uh, where, yes, there's been agreements to do things, to support, to compensate 
uh, victims, uh, handing in of, of weapons, uh, undertaking to do various other things, for example, desist from recruitment of young people. You know, the gangs uh, in Papua New Guinea had systematic programs for inducting children into the gangs when children were incarcerated uh, by a punitive justice system. So they, you know, giving undertakings to desist from that gang uh, recruitment uh, in, in those contexts and a whole lot of things of that, sort, uh, of, of that sort. And one of the most interesting things about what they did politically, they thought their gang problem was such a serious matter that some of those gang surrenders occurred to the Prime Minister and the Minister for Justice and other very, se uh, very senior people would be involved in the latter stages of negotiating with the gang leadership as to what the community could do to create other sorts of employment opportunities, perhaps in government jobs, perhaps in, uh, in, in NGOs. And uh, so that high level political participation was an interesting innovation, I think. I'm Kate, I'm a first year politics student. And I was just wondering, after 18 years, how would you recommend the reintroduction of the restorative um, justice system here? And also, um, would you recommend this system for the Arab-Israeli conflict in the Middle East? Because there's a, been a lot of parallels drawn between apartheid South Africa and the situation there currently. So would you recommend that then for that specific, specific uh, situation? There, there have been some restorative justice experiments with bringing together uh, uh, Arab and is Israeli people. And what they have found is that the end of the process, political positions do not change at all, uh, not one bit, <laughs> not 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 even the slightest changing of minds as a result uh, of the engagement. But and and here's the little chink of light and hope. But considerably more empathy for the suffering of the other, and I think that in a way goes right back to John Cartwright's first question, that you, you know you can't be too ambitious. If you open up some sort of improved space, it might be you know, a basis for longer term hope and in a really deep long term conflict where there are huge geopolitical obstacles to productive diplomacy in the resolution of the of the matter where there's a lack of political will, um, the place to start is with civil society, second track, third track diplomacy starting to open up a bit of space. And so I think, uh, I think restorative justice has, has a place there, hard as it is. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me that is not just stimulating for uh, its intellectual new ideas, but given how we are so embedded in uh, a world of, of crime and violence and uh, often struggle to stand outside of it and think outside the box, look for other kinds of solutions, um, that there are many fascinating ideas here that we need to explore and understand better as a way of dealing with our society and our problems as well as the global issues.